Welcome everyone uh, to our presentation today, Wildlife and Wildlife Photography Best Practices. We are joined here by Steve Vaughn, um, who is a wildlife photographer for many years uh, and also leads, uh, helps to lead field trips for Tucson Audubon. So um, one of our well-known volunteers and we are grateful to have him here to give some expertise on wildlife best practices. Uh, we also should be joined a little bit later by Ian Adrian, another volunteer for Tucson Audubon and uh, an avid wildlife photographer himself. Um, and they're both here to share their expertise and knowledge on, on um, just how to conduct yourself the best way possible to get those uh, photographs while um, you know, not impinging on wildlife. So I'll go ahead without further ado and I'll turn it over to Steve. All right, thank you. Um... So I'll kind of jump to this one. So kind of what we're going to talk about is, you know, best, we try to call it best field practices instead of ethics. This was a discussion we had a couple of years ago, actually at a Tucson Audubon meeting. We tend to think about when we talk about ethics, we we're kind of pointing a finger at a person. When we talk about best field practices, we're really talking about behaviors, not the person. So you, we can all say, We've gone out in the field and we've disturbed birds, but that that doesn't make us unethical. That just means at that time we didn't practice the best field practices that we we could have. Um, so it, it's just kind of a it, it's kind of saying the same thing, but I, I like to make sure that when we talk about something being unethic, unethical, we're not saying the person's unethical. We're saying that what the person may be doing could be done better. Okay, I guess the best way of putting it. And when it comes to ethics, a couple of things you can think about is probably the easiest way to do it is the golden rule. You know, if, if we're getting too close and we're bothering whatever the subject is, how would we feel if someone got that close to us or was doing that or looking at us with a pair of binoculars from 10 feet away? Um, and it also you know, applies to Wildlife, not just birds, it also applies to plants. When we're walking around, we need to be uh, concerned with where we're stepping, what we're doing. So it, it's it's kind of having the big picture versus the narrow field of view of, I'm going and looking for a bird. So kind of what does it mean to disturb birds? There's, there's You hear that all the time. I mean, if you go to Audubon's website or the um, any of the birding websites, they all talk about don't disturb wildlife. Well, what, what does that mean? Um, does that just mean changing their behavior? Because if it does, then pretty much everything we do in the field would be unethical. Because when I believe, whenever we're, and when I, when I speak here, I'm giving my opinions. I'm not saying this is the way it is. I'm going to give you my opinion of the way things are. But I feel like when we're in the field, almost at any time, we are probably changing our subject's behavior. They're aware, aware, they're well aware that we're there. Um, so just kind of think about that. What does changing their behavior, does, does it actually mean? Does it just stop feeding? Does it stop or spooking a whole field of geese? Does that consider disturbance? I would say yes. I didn't disturb these birds. They were taking off on their own. Um, but the other thing I was kind of looking through Facebook a week or so ago when I came across this woman's post and I know her fairly well and she's she's a great photographer and it does I've never seen her doing things in the field that I would say is unethical or or not best field practices but what she said she had a picture of a, a hawk flying away and she her statement was I'm really good good at making birds fly away well to me, that is kind of, I mean, if you know you're doing it, then you really should step back and, and look at your, your field practices. What are you doing or what could you do to reduce the disturbance? I mean, we've all, we've all flushed birds away, I mean, absolutely. And the other thing I, I think about with either birders and or photographers, when we see a bird, we look at it and then we walk up a little closer, we look at it again, walk up a little closer, look at it again, and we essentially keep walking up and getting closer until it flies away. Well, that again is disturbing the bird. We're certainly changing their behavior. And the other thing I'll say is once it flies away, you'll never get that close the second time. So you should always 
try to prevent flushing a bird when, when possible. So here's a question, actually, Kristen and I talked about this one day, about whether it's okay to call birds fishing or um, whatnot. And that's kind of a tough question to answer. So why are we fishing? Why are we using calls, right? I would say we're using calls to bring the birds closer to us. That certainly is changing bird behavior. Um, and then so a lot of like the Audubon website, if you go to that website of their ethical standards, they'll talk about, well, don't use calls during the breeding season because it disturbs the birds. And that's certainly great advice. I will not argue that. But so then my question comes, if you're disturbing them in the spring when they're nesting, what about in the summer right after they finish nesting and they're trying to regain the weight they lost from the stress of raising a, a family? Is that okay? If that, I'm, I'm not gonna answer these questions. I'm throwing these out as questions for you to think about. What about in the winter? It's like, okay, in the winter, their resources are really limited. Their weight's probably down. Is it okay to do it in the winter? Um, again, I'm not answering here. So like, even a, like a junk eye, junk, dark eye junco, it'll lose close to 10% of its body weight overnight in the winter. So we go out in the morning, which is usually when we go birding, and we start playing a call and it comes over to us, it's not feeding. So again, we are changing the behavior and is it causing harm? We don't really know. We can't say it doesn't. You know, we often hear lots of people say, well, I only do it for a few seconds or I only do it a couple of times. We're not bothering them. And that may be true if we're the only one playing that call at that bird at that spot. So again, the cumulative effects of when you're, when you're doing it. So this is actually Ian's side. So I'm gonna to try to fill into what we're talking about. So how do we measure disturbance? Can we measure disturbance? Um, there's something called baseline behavior. And baseline behavior is how animals behave when we are not around. Their base behavior. When they're not disturbed, this is what wildlife would do. So one thing we can look at is a measure of disturbance is if we change their baseline behavior. That would be, again, should be a consideration of disturbance. So if a bird is feeding, say under your feeder in the backyard, and you walk out the door and it stops feeding and looks at you, that is a change in behavior. That is a indication of some sort of disturbance. How, how much we're disturbing, I don't think we can measure that. I think that's something that just can't even be measured. Um, these are uh, a female bobcat and a kitten that's been very common at Sweetwater. We've, we've all seen them on the Sweetwater walks numerous times. Mama is the female there on the right. She will walk within feet of you. If you stop moving and you, you just kind of kneel down or just sit there, she will walk by. I've had her brush my leg. And she's not aggressive. She's not afraid. Normally, you can watch her feeding and hunting. You can watch her with her kitten. And even with a group of, uh, the first time I saw Mama, I was on a Tucson Audubon walk at Sweetwater. And there were 30 of us. This is pre-pandemic. It was a huge group. She stepped out of the brush and she walked right by the group of 30 people. That, that's an exceptional. Um, that is unusual behavior for bobcats, but that is her baseline behavior. She's not afraid of people. And then there are times when people try to approach her too quickly or too fast or too close, her behavior changes and she moves off into the brush. That again is an indication of disturbance. How much that disturbance is, we don't know. Um, and again, I think one of the things we need to consider is how often and how many people are creating that disturbance. So how many people, how many people here saw the white-eared hum hummingbird at Sonoran Desert Museum? Okay. So here's, 
here's an interesting story I'll, I'll give you here. Typically, we think about hummingbirds as being undisturbed by our presence, right? We can sit right beside them. We can walk up to them. They're very tolerant of us. I was there the day after it was found. And I got there at opening at 8.30, and I walked directly to where they were. And I was standing there, and this male would just feed back and forth across this line of flowers. And then in between feeding, he would perch on a branch five feet from, from the side of the trail. By about 8.45, 9 o'clock, there were 12 people there, photographers, birders, whatnot. And there was a lot of movement, a lot of activity, people moving closer. Um, and they were moving close enough for the bird to fly, fly to a different perch. So the first two days, that behavior kind of continued. She hung out in these flowers, perched low in the flowers, right where it was really easy to see her. By day three, he was no longer perching over there. He was perching 25 yards away over a wall, 12 feet from a trail, 12 feet up in a tree. Now, I'm not saying we caused that change of behavior, but the odds are pretty good that we probably did cause that behavior change. Um, and it was, again, it goes back to what the disturbance was, how often it happened. So it, it's essentially, as long as there were daylight, there were people there. And as long as there were daylight, almost the whole time, there were multiple people there, especially the first week or so. So you add the cumulative effects on this, and it, it in my mind, we created that change of behavior. We took this hummingbird that was actually very, very tolerant, and we changed its behavior to not being so tolerant. So one of the things I always try to tell people is wild animals aren't tame. They can be tolerant, but they're tolerant, but they're not tame. So always keep that in mind. We're not dealing with a pet dog that is tame. We're dealing with a wild animal. So the other kind of question I ask is, I was one of those people watching this bird. How much impact did my presence have on it? Something, something to consider. All right. This is the eared Quetzal that showed up in the Chiricahuas on 2020. It showed up first on the uh, west side of the Chiricahuas, then it showed up above, above the uh, Southwest Research Station up by Herb Martyr Campground. So it showed up on the west side and there, were, there was two of them. And the people were chasing them pretty badly up through the canyon. Then they disappeared for a while and then they showed up again up above Herb, Herb Martyr. Um, and again, people were kind of chasing them. They were trespassing, trespassing on private property, um, walking through people's backyards, and the birds disappeared again. And then eventually they moved right down beside the road just before you get to Southwest Research Station. But they stayed behind the fence, so they were kind of protected from the public, generally speaking. There were some birders that would hop the fence and walk back, back there, even though it was private property. Um, it was just kind of interesting because the locals definitely let the people know that it was not okay to trespass on other people's property. So trespassing, I believe, is uh, not best field practices. It's something we shouldn't do without asking for permission. So kind of using this bird as an example, okay? There were people pretty much at this location as long as it was light. Pretty much from 8 a.m. to 5.30 in the afternoon when the sun would set. So, these birds were in the presence of humans all day long. They were, there were times when you couldn't drive up the road. There were so many people parked standing in the road. There were 50 or more people standing in the road waiting for the bird to come back. So not only do you have an individual looking at the bird, you have 50 individuals looking at the bird and they're spread out you know, in a line of probably 15 yards. So you look at this wall of people staring at the birds. How much did that create a, a disturbance? Again, we don't know. Um, and then 
the people showed up every day, day after day after day. So, and again, that's another question, the cumulative effects of people being there, there all day, being there every day and having many, many different people there day after day. So we, again, we can't measure that. Eventually the birds moved on and they weren't, they haven't been seen again since then. I'm not saying we caused them to leave or we caused them to move away, but we don't know. We could have, right? All right, welcome Ian. Oh, can you unmute Ian, Kristen? Uh, yeah, I just, um, you gotta unmute Ian. Oh, there, you go. there he is, all right, welcome. Yeah, yeah, all thank right. you, my, my apologies. I had 1 p.m. on my calendar. Oh, oops. So, yeah, um, thanks for kicking us off, Steve. Right. Um, yeah, have you uh, gotten to uh, my slide yet with the effects of our presence? Um, I can go back to it. Yeah, it's if you just, wouldn't mind. I think it's, oops, not that one. That one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if you touched on this as uh, I'm the latecomer. Um, but um, so as far as measuring our disturbance, it's an interesting question, um, which um, of course uh, we are disturbing the natural world to some degree just by moving around. All animals are reacting to us. Um, so there's nothing we can do to uh, not um, disturb creatures at all. However, there are varying degrees and disturbance isn't always a bad word per se. Um, there are varying degrees of curiosity creatures might have about us. Um, however, um, in this case, um, bobcats, um, a uh, park that both Steve and myself have visited on a number of occasions, um, had a small population of bobcats. And um, on a number of occasions, people would, um, chase or um, perhaps get a little close and actually disrupt the behavior of these resident cats. So in that scenario, um, when they're actually reacting to us, dramatically changing their behavior to avoid us, um, disturbance could definitely be quantified as a bad thing. However, um, ultimately it comes down to just being more cognizant of our movements and trying to reduce that disturbance as much as possible. And I know I disrupted your flow, Steve, so I appreciate you jumping back. No, no, no problem. Right. Please uh, carry on as you were. Actually, it was, you were next there. Now we're here. Yeah, great. Um, so denning, nesting, um, pick uh, which creatures you will, but um, regardless of uh, who it is, um, that's a really sensitive site when uh, creatures um, have young around. In the case of these badgers, it was at Yellowstone National Park and the badgers did chose to establish, the, or I shouldn't say badgers, the babies didn't have a say in it. Um, mm -hmm. The mother did choose to establish a den site right off of a popularly traveled road. Um, however, um, she probably accounted for the cars, but not all the people who subsequently visited. And I was one of those people. Um, I did watch from a respectable distance. She didn't seem to have any reaction, but there were many other people. Um, especially when we're around a nest or den site, it is of utmost importance to be more cognizant of our volume um, and um, to um, try to really minimize how much we are disturbing the creatures there. So in this case in particular, um, and I apologize, I uh, just got a low battery alert on my phone, which is strange because it was charged um, fully one second ago. Um, but um, in this case with the badgers, um, the noise, movement, um, it was causing some degree of disturbance. So it's hard to say that we weren't influencing their behavior in some manner. 
Um, so in uh, the case of this um, situation, um, I actually at one point had to walk onto a hill behind the road um, in order to relieve myself. And I apologize if that's too much information. But um, while walking back there, I didn't realize, but Mama Badger actually had a secondary den back there. And we startled each other, backed off, and everything was okay. However, um, seeing a human in an unfamiliar place, um, probably combined with all the other interactions she wasn't expecting, did eventually cause her to abandon the den site, uh, relocate the babies elsewhere further from humanity. Um, it's not to say people shouldn't watch and appreciate, but it's reiterating the question of when have we overstepped? All right. So kind of following in that, that frame of thought, hummingbird nests, Almost every every spring, you'll see people posting hummingbird photo, hummingbird nest photos that they've taken with their phone, where they've walked up, held the phone right above the nest, and taken pictures of the eggs or the chicks. Which, if if the adults away, that is somewhat minimizing the disturbance. But what we need to be cognizant of is, with with nesting, especially smaller birds, every time we walk up to a nest we're leaving a scent trail for mammalian predators to follow to the nest. The other thing we're doing is we're telling all the other birds around to look over here, hey, look over here, which is something like hummingbirds, like here in Tucson, curbbill thrashers will take hummingbird chicks. So if we're walking up to the nest and, hum and the curbbill thrashers in our area, we're saying, hey, thrashers, here's lunch. Or if we're up in the mountains somewhere where there's jays, jays are notorious for following. They're smart enough to know that you you have food and you'll show them where it is. So it, again, just be cognizant of our disturbance. And the same thing, be cognizant of how close you are. I'm going to use another example of a, a nesting individual. This caracara, sort of like the um, like Ian's subject before, nested right right beside the road, or relatively close to the road. So you could pull off the road and sit in your car, and you could photograph this nest. It was highly publicized on Facebook. So most of the times when you go there, there would either be multiple cars or multiple people out of their cars taking photos of the the nest. And if you were to ask the people who were standing around taking photos, you know, it, it might be better if you get back in your car. Their response was, these birds know me. I come here all the time. They're not afraid of us. It's okay. Well, the two chicks fledged, you know, shortly after that, the two chicks fledged, but in less than a week, they both died of malnutrition. So they didn't receive enough nutrition to fledge with enough weight to survive. The caracaras came back and re-nested, which was an indication, if anybody knows anything about birds, that the chicks didn't fledge because they re-nested right away and they raised another brood and it went through the whole process again. I don't know the final outcome of the second nest, but again, it's just one of those things. We need to be cognizant of, don't assume we're not affecting their behavior. Because I would say almost all the photographers that photographed this, even the ones that were standing there said, Look, I didn't disturb them. These birds fledged. It's what we don't know is the problem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, changing direction a little bit. Um, experience versus the outcome. Um, this is an interesting question because um, a lot of our culture is outcome based. Um, as Steve and I both know, um, photography is outcome based and uh, incidentally um, birding tends to be outcome based in many ways um, and it's not to say that there's anything wrong with having intention um, intentions are wonderful however when we value that intention over the experience itself we not only miss things in the scenery around us 
but um, we uh, can sometimes be blind as to the damage we can cause. Um, referencing what Steve just said about the Caracaras, um, <clears throat> there probably were some signs that um, we were interfering. Um, and, uh, you know, if people had stepped back just a little more and had um, become a little bit more cognizant of um, the experience itself, they may have not prioritized uh, the photographs um, over um, what could have impacted the well being of those two fledglings. Um, and um, the uh, Kawadis referenced in this picture. Um, initially, it was about getting cool pictures. However, this troop of Kawadis, um, I slowly got to know. And over time, um, they did get to know me. And uh, I had little unique things I would do. I would sit a specific distance away and just make it about observing them, appreciating them. And uh, they would actually come quite close and engage in such wonderful antics as you see here, which is two babies wrestling. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting over a little bit of an illness, so you'll have to excuse my voice. But um, wrestling, only a short distance away. And I believe there's another slide there. Yeah, then the case of this Gila monster, um, I was very fortunate to have this photo op, but it was because I saw a Gila monster meander into a pile of brush. Um, I picked a spot that I thought looked somewhat open um, on the other side where I thought the Gila monster might emerge. And I genuinely appreciated um, just uh, being in nature, um, the anticipation, but not just trying to uh, force a photo op. And in time, the Gila monster emerged and walked straight toward me. So um, this unique ground level perspective was afforded just because of being patient and being um, at, uh, if you will, one with the surroundings. Um, the story, of, yeah, um, you can flip to the next one, Steve. Okay. Um, before I uh, get into the story of that picture though, um, a thought regarding the experience versus the outcome. The story of our pictures can have a great influence on others. So it's up to us to decide whether that story is one of protecting the natural world or one of snapping the shot, regardless of our impact. When we actively pursue a specific agenda, we limit every other possibility that could be. We limit ourselves to the tunnel vision of that outcome exclusively. We see less, we hear less, and we limit our perspective. I'm sorry, I just lost my spot. The more attached we are to that specific outcome, the more dramatic measures we will take to achieve it. Situational awareness plummets and we will sometimes cause great damage on our path to desired outcome. This truth applies to all facets of life, but can be especially evident in regard to wildlife photography. As I suspect many of us have done, I have at times grossly overstepped my welcome in pursuit of the perfect shot. I have never intentionally caused harm to a photo subject, but I have definitely inflicted stress. As I have grown as a photographer and nature lover, I have come to find more and more appreciation for the experience itself, relinquishing attachment to the outcome of an image. This has led not only to less personal stress, but also a deeper state of calmness. My greatest intention is now to pass as a quiet observer having as little impact as possible on the behavior of these wild subjects and the land they call home. This new philosophy has led to a richer experience and more beautiful pictures than I could possibly have imagined. And now the picture um, of uh, what we call Apache plume wildflowers. Um, on this particular uh, morning, um, there was actually a camping trip I was doing with a couple of friends and uh, the intention was to get up very early in the morning. Um, and we were actually hoping to see some really neat reptiles. Um, however, um, we ended up sleeping in, having some mishaps early in the morning and we were a little bit frustrated by uh, the way um, it changed the experience itself, myself in particular, as I did have an agenda. Um, however, um, as uh, I started to relax and make peace with the situation, 
um, I noticed the beautiful scenery around me and the early morning sun around this time was just starting to hit these Apache plumes in such a way so the uh, dew drops on them were glimmering and they just had this beautiful glow. Um, and without letting go of that agenda I previously had, I would have never noticed this beautiful scene. Um, in this experience, I was um, actually in Costa Rica last summer and um, I had a couple days into the trip previously um, been searching for different creatures. And this day I decided I was just gonna walk into the uh, beautiful um, forest preserve uh, that was close to Monteverde, if any of you are familiar with it. And I was just going to be present and uh, just appreciate nature as it is without any sort of agenda. Um, a few footsteps into the forest and uh, I saw this mot mot, uh, keel-billed mot mot, land in front of me brandishing a caterpillar. And then I saw another one a short time later brandishing a beetle. And over the course of the next 20 minutes, I was able to sit still and calmly watch them both put on a beautiful display. They slowly got more and more comfortable with me. Um, they uh, sat side by side on a number of occasions while um, you know, they both brandished their prizes. And my suspicion is that a female was hidden nearby, um, hidden amidst the dense foliage. Um, as this went on, um, eventually um, the one with the beetle disappeared and the one with the caterpillar ate the prize, which leads me to believe that the female made her choice and it was not the caterpillar bearer. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share a story here. I was looking at Pam's screen down there. It looks like that looks like maybe the same trees, but either way. So I was leading a photography workshop to uh, Wilcox or down there, Whitewater Draw. And as we were driving to the location from Wilcox, I was talking to the participants. What is it you want to do when we get down here? What What's your goal? What's your what's your agenda, so to speak? And it was very clear their agenda was to photograph the cranes flying overhead. That's that was their agenda. It's like and they didn't even mention anything else, which was kind of interesting. And I was like, and I said, okay, yeah, no problem. We shouldn't have any problem with that. So then we arrive at Whitewater Draw and it's fogged in. And like I was ecstatic. So you know, I get out and started getting our stuff together. And I, I kind of look at the group and they're, they're like, you could just sense this disappointment on their faces. And I'm like, so what's the problem? And they said, it's, it's foggy. <laughs> and I just, and I, it just took me back for a second. It's like, it was spectacular. It was a spectacular morning at Whitewater. So I, I kind of stepped back and I said, all right, take a look at what's right in front of you right now. Be open to this moment and shoot. And I said, we're gonna get cranes flying over, but this opportunity that's right in front of you is here right now. And you don't ever pass up a sure thing, hoping to get something else down the road. So we ended up you know, shooting, the, eventually the fog cleared. We got the cranes flying over just like everyone wanted. So it was a wonderful day. Everybody was happy at the end of the day. So as we're driving back, I asked the group, so what was your favorite part of the day? What do you think it was? The fog. So after they got past that initial, this isn't what I wanted, they got away from the agenda. They were able to appreciate what was right in front of them. Um, that story you shared, Steve, is an absolutely wonderful one and uh, brings me great joy that everyone was able to appreciate that beautiful scene um, as it's not entirely difficult to uh, see sandhill cranes flying in the right spot, but uh, to experience something like that is truly unique. <clears throat> um, so the picture that we're on right now features myself and a wild bobcat approximately five feet away. Um, getting to know individuals enriches the nature experience in so many ways. 
um, not only will you get those beautiful shots and better ones than you could otherwise acquire, um, but uh, you will have stories, wonderful stories. You'll learn things about the creature at hand, and sometimes the creatures will get so comfortable with you that you'll have experiences like this. Um, this is not the only occasion where an animal has gotten this close to me. In fact, uh, with the coatis, um, which I had referenced earlier, um, there was one occasion where one actually uh, got so close that the coati sniffed my shoe. And it was a yearling who I had known um, since um, infanthood. In this occasion, I had been watching this beautiful bobcat for uh, about three years now. Um, she's familiar with my behavior, I'm familiar with hers, and I was just sitting there watching her. She got closer and closer, and the picture that you don't see is that eventually um, she actually ended up bathing herself for perhaps 15 minutes while I just sat there calmly. Way too close for pictures, but a far richer experience entirely. Um, also, as Steve is aware, as he has um, had some wonderful experiences with bobcats as well, um, you'll get to know um, how they move around, so you can make a pretty reasonable guess as to uh, where they might emerge after hunting, um, how long it might take, all sorts of wonderful things. Um, and you feel um, an inclination toward, uh, you know, wanting to protect them and wanting to help others appreciate not just the species, but the individual themselves. Um, in this occasion, um, same bobcat, she had actually um, disappeared in the reeds and Steve was actually with me this day, incidentally. Um, she disappeared, there was some waiting, watching, and then finally, um, I don't know, do you recall, Steve, how much time passed before it she emerged? It was probably 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, but she actually emerged right where she had uh, gone in, um, give or take a few inches, with this cotton wrap that she had just captured. And while I watched this, um, she actually dropped the cotton wrap right there, let her kitten, who had been following behind, pick it up. And then they both um, leapt out of uh, this habitat and carried on uh, their good old uh, journeys. So all because of getting to know this one individual creature. Um, another instance with bobcats, you perhaps have noticed something of a theme now, but this uh, cat, um, he had met me a number of times before. I um, am always calm. I move slowly. I speak quietly if I need to speak at all when I'm watching wild creatures. Um, so I don't try to hide myself from them. I just get them comfortable with me by being non-threatening. In this case, he walked right by so close that I could yet again not have taken an individual um, or a photo of this individual. And you will notice that even among um, the same species, every individual has a very unique personality, whether we're talking about mammals, birds, reptiles, even insects. And it's incredible to get to know those different quirks. One other thing I'll throw in real quick to, with the fact that Ian and I have spent so much time with these cats, there's something called displacement behavior. Displacement behavior is when an animal is threatened or, or stressed, it'll do some behaviors to kind of try to alleviate the stress. Sometimes it's just grooming. Sometimes actually a real common displacement behavior is a big long yawn. They open their mouth very wide and yawn. But what's interesting with this displacement behavior is you have to have it in context because you can look at a bobcat yawning and it can either be quiet or tired, or it could be stressed. You can watch the ears of the bobcats. So there's a lot of things you get to know when you get to know the individuals. Um, yeah, um, and uh, this can also um, help you to educate people um, on, um, when uh, perhaps they're encroaching too much because you can say firsthand um, that you know this behavior is stress related or vice versa, or even that you can say that this animal is very calm, does not look threatened. 
Um, in this case, I realize um, a lot of uh, birding folk don't get too excited about burdens as they're not considered a rarity. Um, in fact, anything but around here in the Southwest. However, um, I have a unique fascination with watching birds build nests. Uh, something about a creature that only has a beak and a few toes at its disposal, um, weaving uh, brand or little uh, twigs and branches delicately amongst one another. Um, something about it. Anyway, uh, this burden, I was uh, just going for a little nature walk and I saw the burden fly by with a stick. And I uh, thought that was a pretty good indication of nesting behavior. So um, I kept my distance, watched and uh, Verdon placed the stick. Verdon seem, didn't seem to show any reaction on my presence, so I sat down and got cozy, and Verdon brought stick after stick, and I returned to watch this nest slowly get built up over the course of the next week several times. Um, on this particular occasion, uh, Mr. Verdon actually uh, brought in this beautiful feather from a bigger bird, placed it in the nest haphazardly, flew off to sing. Nest or feather got dislodged, Verdon came back, grabbed the feather, put it back. I got to watch this happen three times until on the last iteration, the Verdon um, had flown quite a bit further away to uh, hopefully call in a mate and I uh, didn't notice it and the feather was gone. But not only did I get to watch this incredible process of building the nest, but I got to watch this little bit of feather drama ensue as well. Um, and I could predict where the Verdon would land. Um, he had his little routine. So I was only able to get this picture because I got to know his behavior and um, had a pretty good guess each time of where he'd land, even though he didn't stay perched for more than a second or two each time. Um, yet again, jumping back to the Kawadi Mundis, um, on this um, particular experience, um, I had gotten to know them the season before and had spent substantial time with them. Um, this was actually a fresh batch of babies uh, from this particular summer. And um, I was watching them and one of the older adults was watching the babies. And uh, I was able to watch and uh, she led them very close to me. Um, I moved a little bit, she was unthreatened, uh, babies were unthreatened. And um, I was maybe 20 or so feet away when I snapped this. I got to watch the babies playing, wrestling, so rich. Um, and no one was threatened at any point during that day. There were no alarm calls, barely even um, a look in my direction during this whole experience. So kind of getting going, continue with the getting to know individuals, a great place to get to know individuals is your backyard. If you've got feeders, you've got a perfect opportunity to, to get to know individual birds. This particular Costas hummingbird was in my backyard and I just knew over and over where he was going to land. So I could sit there and just wait for him to come in and land and I was able to get a lot more interesting photos than I probably would have had if I just kind of walked out the door and tried to take one. I, I spent hours in the backyards with, with this guy. Another example of getting to know individuals. Um, two particular years, I spent 30 days in a row standing by this nest. So I pretty much knew where the birds were gonna be, what they were gonna do, when they were gonna come into the nest. Um, where to expect them to perch. So I got to, it was just one of those interesting times where you could just sit there and you're, you're watching individuals, they're, they're your, they become your family. When you really get to know these guys, they're, they're your family. And if you can stay, if your behavior remains non-threatening, it, it, they know it, but it only takes one false move to, to change that. If, if, you, if you do spook them, you're not going to get that same level of comfort with them in the future. So it, it, I just really feel it's important to get to know individuals. And the other thing is, is what we can learn from individuals. So much of science is based on data. Pygmy owls do this, pygmy owls do that. But 
that that may be true, but what does this pygmy owl do? Or what does this pair of pygmy owls do? You get to learn the intimacy that you would never, you would never get any other way. And I feel this intimacy we, we have with, you can acquire with creatures is easily as important as any kind of scientific data we can acquire. Yeah, um, I uh, want to follow up with something Steve mentioned about these animals being family. Um, I sometimes have trouble spending more than a few hours with my family, but uh, <laughs> watching uh, wild animals uh, do their thing, um, man, that never gets old. Um, so citizen science um, regarding uh, what we can learn just by observing. Um, I, uh, I'm sure every single one of you has experiences, um, that you've seen that, uh, maybe, um, the books aren't able to answer, maybe the interwebs aren't able to answer, um, things entirely unique, or maybe some of you have even contributed to the database that we call science. Um, and the, the natural world is full of so much magic, and we are just beginning to understand, um, so much of it and there's so much more to learn and uh in my humble opinion the best way to do it is by getting out there and being present in our surroundings um in this case uh, we have what's called an uh banded rock rattlesnake um this species is kind of a neat species to see in arizona um unique to a handful of uh, mountain ranges um while traipsing uh sort of um, in um, a lesser visited area, um, I saw this snake and uh, right before my eyes, this snake, which was the color of the leaf right behind him or her, uh, changed from that beige color to gray. Um, I watched this happen within the course of a couple seconds as I stood there. Um, several uh, herpetologists with whom I'm friends um, were skeptical on uh, my account of this experience um, because it maybe hasn't been heavily or hasn't been documented at all. Um, a number of reptiles are known to be able to change their body color and very quickly, but with snakes, um, it's not a thing that's um, been heavily observed or noted within the scientific community. So we can contribute a lot just by um, watching and keeping an open mind to everything that's around us. Okay, here's, here's another example. So last summer at the birding festival, Tucson Audubon's birding festival here, I led a hummingbird photography workshop to Patton Center. So we're sitting there photographing hummingbirds and while we were there, this fledgling drops out of the nest and lands in a bush right in front of us, in front of our group. So we were sitting there kind of watching and it's really interesting. And then mama would come in and feed the chick and then fly off, and then she'd fly up to the nest because the other chick was still in the nest. She'd fly up and feed the other chick. She'd leave and come back. And this went on for, for a while, which was kind of interesting. And then kind of over the side, well, at Patton Center, there's lots of hummingbirds around and, and there's a lot of territorial disputes. So not too far from where this fledgling had landed, there was a feeder and there was a juvenile uh, broadbill hummingbird kind of defending that territory over by that feeder. And when this female would come in and feed, occasionally he would come over and chase the female away. Like you're invading my territory. So then what happened was something really interesting. And so what's wrong with this picture? Well, it's the wrong species. There's no records of interspecies within hummingbirds feeding. There's also no records of male hummingbirds feeding chicks. So this is a broadbill hummingbird feeding a juvenile black chick, or what looks like a female um, broadbill feeding a black chick. And you know, our group is sitting here watching this and we're all kind of going, what's going on? Because I was pretty much convinced it wasn't feeding but I didn't have an explanation for it. I was like, well, if it's not feeding, what's going on? And, and 
if if I had just shown those two photos, you really wouldn't have a good feel for what happened. But standing there at the end of the field trip, everyone left and came back to Tucson. I had driven down on my own so I could set up early. I spent another four hours there watching this fledgling and watching this behavior. So what happened is, you know, the female would come in and feed, and then eventually the male started chasing the female off more regularly. And then, then he would land sometimes next to this fledgling and kind of poke at it like, you're my territory, get out of here, get out of here. So that kind of continued for a while, but as the time progressed, he became more aggressive towards the female, less aggressive towards the chick, and what would almost his his time between landing on the branch and sticking his bill into the fledgling's mouth got shorter. So again, it was like, what what's going on? I posted the two photos on the on Facebook, and everyone came back with all kinds of different reasons for what could be happening. But I kept saying, you know, none of these explanations I was getting made sense with my observations. So eventually I sent an email to Sherry Williamson, who Sherry Williamson, um, who wrote the field guide to hummingbirds. She's an Arizona resident here that I know. And I said, this is what I saw. What's going on here? So she got back with me with a, a reply, which was she goes, what, you, what you're seeing here really is extremely rare. And as far as she knows, only been recorded once or twice. The other record was of a blue throat, juvenile blue throat hummingbird doing the same behavior to a blue throated hummingbird nest. Okay. So what she said is, well, think about how hummingbirds learn to feed. They learn from their parent or their, from their mother what flowers to feed on, where to go, and how to feed. So what her explanation was, this was the broadbills had observed the female coming to this location and this individual bird. And what the, the juvenile was interpreting was feeding behavior, the female feeding from the chick, not the female feeding the chick. So he came in. He stuck his bill in. He got food because the chick had just been fledged or been fed. He got fed. He left and would come back. And on subsequent visits, he realized that this was a food source for him. So it was just kind of really interesting that if I had sat there just assuming that this broad bill was feeding, I wouldn't have really taken the time to really observe it closely and to really think about what was going on. I kept it intentionally telling myself, don't think about this as a feeding behavior, think about what you're seeing. And so, all right. So as we begin to wrap up, um, I'd like to share a quote by a uh, renowned photographer, um, writer and uh, general creative, uh, Guy Tal. <clears throat> Finding happiness as a photographer, as an artist, and as a human being is not about the camera you use or even the images you create. It's about living a life that is meaningful and rewarding. It's about experiencing things that elevate your soul. That's a powerful quote. Um, to me, it says that when we're in nature, it can be so much more than just about counting species, getting pictures, uh, whatever it might be. Um, those things are all fun um, and they are very rewarding, but there's a spiritual element to it as well. There's um, a deeper connectedness. Um, anytime we step out of our front doors, we could see something that no human has witnessed before. Um, we could see things that will inspire us or um, things that we can share with others, which will inspire them uh, to be better stewards to the planet um, or just uh, a new perspective that we might apply to our lives. But if we aren't open to the experience in front of us, we'll miss all of that beauty. Yes. 
Okay, I think that's all we have. It's, we're open to questions. Awesome. Thank you both so much. Um, let's turn it over to any audience questions we might have. I don't think anything came through in the chat, although uh, Pam did clarify that her photo is from Bosque del Apache. Now. Oh, okay. But Got similar it. landscapes, I imagine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself or put them in the chat. Happy to read them out loud for you. Hi, this is Pam. I don't have any questions. I think you answered a lot of my questions. As a landscape photographer, I appreciate the entire landscape, but I'm just beginning to be more toward bird photography and and wildlife. So I always worry when I'm out there, am I not doing well? Should I be quiet? You know, don't want to chase them away, even in my own yard. And so I I appreciate all that you have presented here. It really helps me feel better about what I do and trying to be careful because uh, it's easy, very easy to disturb those birds. And even in my yard, I try not to be that way. <laughs> so thank you. Sure, thank you, thank you. Good, good observations. One, one of the things I would say personally, if, if I'm in a new area and the subjects don't know me, I try to be quiet. If I'm working with subjects that I'm going to be seeing over and over and over, I actually do talk to them. I let them I, hear my voice. I do too. <laughs> People mm -hmm. probably think I'm strange in my yard, but I, if I'm around them and I love the little burdens that come to our yard and, and the hummingbirds, I always talk to them softly. Yes. And they come right up to you sometimes when you do that. So, you know, I think it's just a, a joy to be out, but be nice and be quiet, you know, and love and them. Your, your tone of voice is telling him you're not threatened. Yeah, that's why I don't, I'm not loud. I just say, hello, uh, hi, hi, how you doing? And they just will flood up around me. I have a, a little broad build right now that's decided it took over the side patio. It comes <laughs> up and every time I go out, it comes right up to me and I don't do anything but say, hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Nice. So, it's just wonderful to be in the whole wild world. It is. And you know, people don't know how beautiful it is unless you're out there looking at everything. So thank you again. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. I did also, since I know we're a little over time, we can do a couple more questions. That's kind of the beauty of Zoom. But um, just in case some people have to leave, I wanted to throw in a plug for the in-field workshop that Steve and Ian will be conducting this Saturday, January 7th at Whitewater Draw. Um, so if you want a chance to get out in the field with them, learn even more, and of course, get to see the cranes and other amazing uh, waterfowl that's down at Whitewater right now, um, please go to our website, register for that trip. I did put the link in the uh, email that I sent out with the Zoom information this morning. Um, I'll also send up a follow-up email and I'll include the registration link in that as well so that you can uh, find that easily. But we're still looking for people to join that trip. So please, please come along. Um, if you learned anything here today, uh, hopefully you'll learn even more out in the field. Um, so yeah, let's see if we have any other questions um, before we wrap up. Anyone else wanted to unmute themselves? Well, I guess this is a testament, Stephen Ian, to how well you covered the subject that <laughs> people can't think of any questions now. Though, of course, if you have questions later on, um, you're welcome to email me and I can direct you to Stephen Ian. Or I did CC them on the email this morning, so you should be able to just respond to that email and send it right to them uh, if you have questions for them. And I hope that you'll consider joining the field trip this weekend. Um, thank you both so much, Stephen Ian. Did you have any uh, last comments or anything you wanted to say? No, thank you. Thank you for attending. Awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I would like to second that. Thank you. Um, again, reiterate my deepest apology for um, my uh, timing being off. Um, anyone who's still left on here, though, I'd like to pose a little question to meditate on. Um, when you have a moment, uh, just consider um, a beautiful photo op or 
observation um, that you missed because you were so caught up in the outcome. Or on the contrary, consider um, a situation where you weren't caught up in the outcome and if you had been, you wouldn't have experienced such a rich moment as you did. Love that. Great ending uh, note, food for thought there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephen Ian, again. And thank you, everyone, who joined us today. I uh, hope to have you come back for another event another time. Have a good rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye, Steve.